thank you very much for um, everybody who's joined. Um, so this is a session on uh, flexibility in the energy system. And the topic being, can we really save 10 billion pounds through flexibility, which was the value that was put into the smart systems and, and flexibility plan, which the government published in, in the summer. With just under two weeks to go to COP26, um, there's lots of uh, announcements coming out. Um, we had the net zero plan, uh, the net zero strategy. We had the um, heat um, strategy coming out this week. Um, and just like to thank everybody for joining. So today we're gonna have um, a mix of speakers going through a mix of topics, all related to the um, and, and smart energy systems and flexibility. So after my introduction, I'm going to pass over to um, Rosie McGlynn to talk on energy policy, Dan Peter Mori to um, talk about VPPs in operation, virtual power plant, um, David Shields to cover the consumer experience for Marx, and uh, Ryan Gilmore to talk about flexibility scenarios. At the end, we'll have a set, uh, some time for Q&A. Um, we're not going to interrupt the speakers during the process, but just put any um, questions into the chat as we go along, and then I'll moderate the um, panel session at the end. So just to quickly introduce the speakers, there's myself, um, Director of Scene Connect and CEO of Zoos. Um, we've got Rosie McLynn from Mintuni Energy, and um, strategy advisor for Zoos. We've got David Shields, um, who's the um, CPO for Zoos and director of Lopagen. We've got um, Dan Peter, JP Marie um, from Inbala, business development director for um, Europe. And we've got Ryan Gilmore, simulations lead for um, Scene and Zoos. So just a bit of an introduction into um, what brings um, the partners together and our credibility in being able to talk about this topic. So we were um, we have been part of a 21 month journey um, through the midst of the pandemic and um, Brexit uh, to design energy systems um, to meet the needs of the 21st century through a collaboration between UK and Canadian governments, where seven finalist teams were selected, each comprising UK and Canadian partners to develop and demonstrate their smart energy solutions. So our project, Cloud Zoos, was one of the UK um, projects focused in Huntley in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. And why are we looking at this? Well, two things, one, as we transition to net zero, you've got to tackle the issues to do with increasing electrical demand on the network. Each new heat pump has the equivalent to one new house and each um, new EV charge point adds the equivalent of one more. The other thing is new rooftop solar PV adds further challenges for a network which wasn't really designed for bi-directional energy flows, but coordinated operation can ensure the local system remains in balance without the need for um, expensive infrastructure upgrades. Second part is as we transition to a energy generation system, which is driven by renewables, we need to have a system where the demand can match generation rather than generation um, ramping up and down to match demand, which was the 20th, 20th century thermal model. So flexibility shifts demand from peak to off-peak times when power from renewables could otherwise be left unused. But of particular interest to us is how to deliver a just transition to net zero, because it's all very well designing the technical um, systems to operate um, the energy system, but we need to make sure that it's inclusive um, and it allows for all the needs of users. Change can be difficult to manage, particularly for vulnerable customers. And ensuring new arrangements are fair, inclusive, and affordable is critical for the energy system. 
or to be fair for consumers. So I'm now going to pass it over to Rosie and McGlynn, who's going to talk to us about policy and markets. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Alex, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us at what is a really, really busy time as we move forward towards COP26. Um, and I'll just be talking about the, the UK and the European policy context in relation to net zero and flexibility. And I think just, just to begin with some positives from a UK perspective, um, you know, we do hope that COP26 will seek um, you know, some stretch targets for the world in terms of moving forward and supporting the achievement of 1.5 degrees. And the UK government has done a huge amount in terms of driving that agenda, um, following on from the CCC's net zero report. And the UK was the first economy to set legally binding targets. Our emissions have decreased by 44% since 1990. And by 2030, no petrol or diesel vehicle will be sold in the UK. So we've had you know, a lot of progress that has been led from having you know, legally binding targets and a framework that will drive forward markets towards decarbonisation. And we also have the Smart Systems Plan, which is a joint plan from Bayes and Ofgem, which really which sets out the, the, the deliverables for the UK that will support a decentralised energy system and will promote the utilisation of flexibility. And in the UK currently, the flex markets and platforms are maturing. The DNOs procured 1.6 gigawatts of flex in 21, and the smart systems plan indicates that this could be 13 gigawatts by 2030. And throughout the past couple of years during lockdown, the utilization of systems assemblies has been tremendous in leading to a far more engaged public who want to be involved in taking direct action to tackle climate change because it's going to be up to every single citizen to make changes in their own lives for us to achieve net zero. So I think we've made a really, really great start in the UK. However, we do have some challenges, which I will cover in the next slide. So from, from a UK perspective, um, I don't think anybody will be surprised to sort of see this slide setting out the sort of the, the seismic challenges facing the UK retail energy market. Um, with around 15 suppliers exiting in 2021 so far um, and more to come before Christmas. Our current policy and regulatory framework doesn't support the decentralised energy systems which are going to be crucial for net zero. Our market arrangements aren't fit for purpose in relation to enabling whole system price signals being accessed by domestic customers and we don't have a framework that enables localised supply tariffs and through engagement with community energy groups, we know that one of the key focuses for them is the ability to say, we get our energy locally and it's green. And in terms of you know, the economic impact currently of the crisis in the energy market, supply tariffs are likely to increase to 2000 pounds in 2022. And that will drive many, many more customers into fuel poverty and I won't dwell on the other fiscal arrangements at a UK level, which are also leading to that crunch. And from a local authority perspective, local authorities are gonna be absolutely critical to delivering local energy plans. In Scotland, local heat and energy efficiency strategies will be, will be legislated. So it will be required that local authorities have LHEs in place, but the fiscal frameworks within which they operate and the other challenges they face with their budgets mean that it's going to be very challenging to deliver those climate emergency plans by 2030 or by the mid-2030s. And it's going to be critical that they're able to access new sources of revenue to support the required delivery of millions of LCTs by mid-2030. And it's clear that market reform is needed to unlock domestic flex and localised energy services. And predominantly, um, you know, we see the implementation of the local electricity bill as being critical to that because that will unlock access to millions of households and tenants to renewable energy tariffs provided locally and administered by trusted parties who want to deliver value for those communities. So while we have a framework that has been designed to drive forward elements of the market reform needed to hit net zero, there is a, a huge amount left to do 
from a UK policy perspective to actually unlock the ability of citizens to access net zero markets. And I'll move on now to touch on what's happening at a European level. So again, again the, the, the legislation framework within Europe has been set out to enable um, citizens to participate actively at a community level. So the clean energy package did create this enabling framework to facilitate that and to drive forward greater access to renewable generation. And we can see that by 2030, we're gonna have a huge increase in renewable generation capacity um, being provided at a distribution grid level. And we expect to see between 50 to 70 EVs on the road. And what that will mean is that the, the DSOs active in Europe are going to have to change the way that they actively manage their grids. And they're gonna to have to procure new services in order to do that in a way that means that sort of you have reliability and quality of power without loss of supply, but using decentralized energy techniques. And I'll touch on that on the next slide, please, Alex. So what we've seen from a European point of view is that um, the concept of distribution system operator has been in place for many, many years in, in, in Europe. And this concept of having system services being procured by DSOs is maturing. And um, recent sort of conferences facilitated by Euroelectric and Rescoop have really focused in on how flexibility services can be considered to be a sustainable alternative to grid upgrades and they can be delivered cost effectively as well. It is the case that technical standards and regs are still required to, to fully unlock the value of flexibility and that there's full access to markets by prosumers, community energy, energy groups and DSR aggregators, because there are sort of still barriers to entry um, across Europe for different parties seeking to enter flex markets. And that's where regulation will be key in terms of enabling that barrier-free access. And it's also the case that the, the network tariffs will have to be reviewed and, and updated to ensure that the full benefits of flex are passed through to the end consumer. And I wanted just to sort of have that um, sort of sustainability goal seven there in terms of affordability and, and clean energy. And I think what's, what's clear is that from an EU point of view, there is a huge commitment to achieving that sustainability goal. And the member states are, you know, are, are working towards that. There are a few challenges in some of the member states, sort of those states that are sort of are more um, comfortable with coal. Um, but I think in general, I think that the, the European states are leading the way in trying to unlock flexibility to make renewable energy open and accessible to all of their citizens. And I'll pass back to Alex. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rosie. Very interesting, like so wide, wider context <clears throat> there. Now I'm going to pass over to um, JP Marie from Mbala, who's going to, going to give us an overview of like the, the um, role of the virtual power plant in the energy system. Over to you, JP. Thanks, Alex. In this section, like Alex said, I'm going to discuss the challenges of the energy transition and specifically the role of uh, virtual power plants or VPPs uh, play to address these. In general, grids are unable to store power and therefore grids need to be balanced or in other words, what goes in must come out. Traditional grid balancing is managed by accurate forecasts of demand and centrally generated supply but with the increasing distributed energy resources like solar PV, wind parks, e-mobility, etc., accurate forecastability becomes challenging. Grid stability is also challenged as more local issues may occur due to local demand and supply of which the grid operator has no visibility of. After all, many of the distributed energy resources or DERs are behind the meter. Therefore, power generation that can be switched on and off rapidly in real time is really key for grid stability. This we usually refer to as flexibility. Here you see a few quotes that confirm this, the increasing need for flexibility. And I will explain a bit more on the work we have done with AGL in Australia in a few minutes. You see in the middle of this uh, slide uh, a quote of uh, the CEO of AGL. 
In this schematic view of a grid, I'm also showing you a number of relevant DERs or assets with relevant stakeholders in the value chain that also need some degree of management. In the next slide, I'm showing you uh, the key need to manage all these kinds of different DERs that provide flexibility. And that need is a truly integrated platform like Embala's Concerto platform. Integrated in the sense of being able to connect with many different asset types of different vendors, but also the ability to address different, different markets from residential and e-mobility to commercial and industrial. A virtual power plant solution provides you with real-time capability to make flexibility available to maintain the balance in a grid. Usually this is the responsibility of the transmission system operator or GSO. The balancing system mechanism is geography wide and TSOs usually introduce different markets to make flexibility available for this purpose. For example, ancillary services or intraday trading and, uh, and some more. These functions are all represented in the left-hand side of the diagram platform, the platform diagram. On the right-hand side of the diagram, you see functions that also require awareness of the physical grid characteristics and thus also have a localization component. Usually, distribution network operators or DNOs have very limited visibilities on many DERs and lack the capability to include these when managing the grid. With the DERMS functions on the right hand side of this diagram, the platform will contribute in managing local grid stability, for example, by line loss optimization, voltage control, and distribution power flow control. With a platform that integrates both VPP and DERMS functions, true optimization with multiple value stacking is within reach. Globally, many VPPs and several microvis have already been implemented. Compared to regions like North America and APAC, Europe seems a little behind to include residential in these. This might have to do with the lower penetration of chillers or air conditioners, uh, and other assets with high power consumption. Also, the high feed-in tariffs for solar PV may hinder vast rollout of home batteries. Further penetration of heat pumps and electrical vehicles combined with a general trend of reducing feed-in tariffs in the near future should make the implementation of PPPs in the residential space in Europe more attractive. In the next slide, I'm showing you an interesting case that I already mentioned at AGL Australia, where we are helping to build the largest PPP around the world. The plan is to manage up to 50,000 distributed home batteries combined with solar PV with our VPP solution within the next three years. Currently, we are finalizing phase one, where we already manage up to 1,000 batteries on the residential uh, side. In the next slide, I'm going to give you an example of how the solution uh, works for self-consumption optimization. You see that here. Um, the orange trace is the monitored generated power of solar PV. And the green trace is the aggregated power of home load, solar PV, and the battery. Before sunrise, the home load is supplied by the battery. And this is indicated in the picture with a one. After sunrise, the solar power is used to charge the battery. You see that at two. Home load in this phase is provided by solar. At four, somewhere in the middle of the diagram, the battery is fully charged and the solar power is exported to the grid. At seven, you see that there is a demand response event scheduled. And this is as much as possible powered by solar PV. However, as it is close to sunset, the remainder of the required power is provided by the battery. After the event, home load is coming from the battery and export to the grid has been stopped. I hope this is a nice illustration for you of the value add of the VPP in this specific case, but also shows its necessity in the energy transition. I'd like now to hand it over back to uh, Alex. Thanks very much, JP. And I'm just going to move straight on to um, David Shields, who's going to talk about the consumer experience um, as evidence through our Power Forward Challenge demonstrator. Over to you, David. 
Yeah, thanks very much, Alex. Um, so in this section, I will just turn our attention onto the pilot that we've been running in uh, Aberdeenshire. Uh, so firstly, to set the scene, um, the purpose of the pilot was to integrate a number of distributed energy resources and clusters throughout the town of Huntley in order to establish a connected community of energy assets that we'd use to test the Zeos platform. Um, part of the project funding was to allow us to install the assets and properties in the catchment area. So the first obstacle that we had to overcome was to sign up the participants for the pilot trial. Alex, if you can skip on, please. Despite having a good level of engagement with residents through the initial awareness raising exercises and having support from the excellent Huntley District Development Trust, uh, we weren't actually able to sign up as many shortlisted properties for eligible installations as we'd hoped. So firstly, I'm going to touch on some of the reasons why that was the case. So first of all, planning. <clears throat> it turns out that Huntley is actually in a conservation area, or at least most of the town is, and that there's a relatively high proportion of listed buildings in the area too. So despite the fact that there was actually a clear precedent for rooftop solar across the town, we were forced to endure the full planning process for most of the solar PV installations, even though all of the applications that we submitted were actually approved after the formalities. With regards to attaining planning permission for air source heat pumps though, it was a little bit more challenging and initial environmental impact assessments flagged concerns around noise levels at neighboring properties for the majority of the installations that we looked to undertake. That brings me on to the next challenge, which was uh, around the building stocks in Huntley. For the purposes of characterizing the challenges here, we'll consider the properties in two different categories, one being traditional properties, and two modern properties, where modern is anything built circa 1960s and newer. With each of these having the same two subcategories, which was either terraced or detached, semi-detached. For each of the long listed properties, we assessed the dwelling suitability for the installation of both solar PV and battery and air source heat pumps. So considering the factors purely related to the building characteristics, first of all, PV and battery challenges were as follows. One, a lack of roof space, particularly evident on your more modern terrace type properties, where things like dormer windows were in the roof spaces, stopping us from being able to install uh, solar on the roof space. Uh, two, poor condition of roofs. Um, this was particularly on more traditional properties where they hadn't been well maintained, uh, ones that just hadn't been looked after. Um, three, a lack of suitable space for a battery. Uh, again, particularly evident on your smaller terraced properties and four access limitations for the erection of scaffolding, particularly prevalent for the terraced properties. Next, considering just building characteristics again, but this time in relation to a heat pump, it was found that the proximity to a neighboring property was the biggest obstacle. Um, this was only really applicable for terraced properties with most of the detached and semi-detached properties in the town having plenty of land to separate them from their neighbors. So from this, you might recognize that there's a bit of a trend. The most challenging uh, properties to find suitable installation candidates for theirs were the modern terraced dwellings. In contrast, properties where the conditions were most optimal were found in traditional detached category, um, particularly those that were well maintained. Uh, this was an interesting insight for us because if you consider the likely socioeconomic status of the householders in those two categories of housing, it suggests that the more affluent will have a better access to the green revolution. Um, and not just because they can afford the high capital investment for the dares, but also because their property types are more often better suited to the dare installations as well. This hypothesis that we had was further proven out when we approached Grampian Housing Association, Osprey Housing Association and Aberdeenshire Council about participation in the pilot, um, all of whom were very supportive, but we were unable to identify any suitable properties from their housing stocks across the three registered social landlords. Key takeaway from that for the ZOS team is that as a society, we really need to find alternative ways to ensure lower income households aren't left behind in the transition to net zero energy landscape. It's particularly a problem um, for, for those terrace properties and more modern properties, the ones that we tended to find with the RSLs, um, but it's something that ZOAS can look to try to um, mitigate through things like collective self-consumption models. Um, and that's something that we're going to explore in the upcoming pilot projects that we have with Perth and Kinross Council and Curlook Energy Club. 
The final barrier on here um, to discuss was the uh, ROI for heat pumps. Um, from the heat pumps that we modelled, um, we were only able to identify three households where there was an economically viable business case. Um, however, two pulled out when they were informed of the disruption that would be caused by the installation, and the other one was rejected at planning because of the noise. Thankfully, we did manage to find one participant who was willing to progress with the heat pump, despite the fact that it was actually going to cost him about £200 more per year than his current central heating system. Um, but he was just really keen to decarbonise his heat. A true eco-warrior right there. Alex, can we move on, please? So once we had the participants signed up, we then had to identify suitable assets, procure them, install them and integrate them with the Zoos platform some of which would have been made much easier had the SMETs rollout been further forward and better thought through. So what's wrong with SMETs? Well, firstly, the lack of penetration. We only found two SMETs two metres in the 50 or so properties that we surveyed. And of the SMETs two metres that we did find, we then realised that they were somewhat useless to us anyway because of the lack of data accessibility. But even if we had been able to integrate with them, the problem would still have been that there's a lack of functionality with SMETs Although you can monitor import and export, you can't get data on self-consumption, battery state of charge, individual large loads, etc. And in our opinion, that's a real missed opportunity for the SMETS device to be a single source of energy data in a household that could be providing valuable insights to all stakeholders in that green energy revolution. The next challenge for us was to identify technology partners who would be willing to collaborate by establishing open data sharing protocols. The manufacturer's objections were mainly down to two factors. One, the desire to protect IP, and two, the belief that their data insights might provide commercial advantage in a future energy marketplace. Well, of course, we can understand and appreciate the desire to protect any commercially sensitive information. It was widely reported that the lack of collaboration presents a risk to the decarbonisation of the energy system, and at the very least, it's slowing down progress. The partners behind Zuos are all vocal exponents of a standardized data sharing protocol, both between smart energy device manufacturers and also with system operators. And open data sharing protocols will accelerate the speed of progress and it will allow innovative startups such as Zuos ourselves to access a level playing field. So we'll continue to push this agenda. With regards to the market volatility, I'll just say COVID, Brexit and the renewable heat incentive and leave it at that. Uh, clearly, two of those influencing factors are hopefully once in a lifetime events. Um, however, it really does highlight the fragility of the supply chain for renewables and low carbon technologies. So it would be prudent for the UK government just to take note and consider what can be done to shore up that market, uh, because we're so reliant upon it for us to achieve our decarbonisation plans. On the installation capabilities, um, that's one of for a bit of soul searching. Um, despite having quite a reasonably tech savvy bunch in the team here um, and knowing our way around the typical domestic energy supply, we were fairly ill prepared for the complexities of installing and integrating the energy monitoring systems. And the most part that was due to the weird and wonderful setups that we found when we went to the domestic dwellings, um, some of which were over 100 years old. Um, but even with straightforward new build properties, we found that the energy monitors in the market right now were unable to cope with on-site storage. And therefore, there was much trial and error and return visits to all of the properties with theirs at least once to change set points for data transfer. In summary of that, um, there's a real battle raging for the connected smart devices. Um, in one case, we came across a distribution board where there was five individual devices that all had CTs connected to the incoming electric supply. There was an EV charger, a PV inverter, a battery, a heat pump, and an energy monitor. And that's not to mention the number of times that we had to install extender bars to the back of a modem to get internet connectivity through an ethernet port as well. Surely no one would have expected the internet of things to be such a mess of wires. And until we can establish better collaborative practices with a little bit of piggybacking here and there, we'll continue to need to connect a new device every single time. So it's not really that smart after all. Alex, move on, please. Okay, so what came first, the local energy market or the smart local energy system? Chicken and egg, catch 22, market pull, market push. You can call it what you want, but the conundrum is real. 
is the technology going to create the marketplace or without the marketplace will innovators be reluctant to invest in the technology developments that are required? Unfortunately, I can't answer that question, but what I can tell you is my opinion on what an enabled marketplace looks like. One that would catapult Zeus from a niche future technology to a household name. So in my opinion, we need at least four things. We need some sort of meter splitting arrangement that would allow settlement of two or more energy suppliers at one endpoint. We need a hyper local uh, time of use tariff. We need peer to peer trading mechanisms and we need community ownership models for energy assets. Through Zeus, we're hoping that we can deliver the mechanisms for peer to peer trading and community ownership models. But the meter splitting and dynamic tariffs will really unlock that market for the consumers who are going to use this product in the end. So we watch the space with interest. Alex, back over to you. Thanks, David. Very uh, in, interesting to hear the um, specifics of like the, the challenges that you face on the ground um, that need to be tackled at a system wide level as well. So without further ado, I'm going to pass to our last speaker of the day, um, Ryan Gilmore, who's going to talk about the flexibility scenarios that we ran um, through simulations on um, the network. Over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, so um, the other speakers have given a nice introduction to the kind of operational side of the pilot that we've been running. Um, but we've also been co-developing a simulations platform that I'm going to talk to you today about. Um, and I'm going to talk through some of the use cases and how, how it can be utilized. Um, and that kind of depends on which stakeholder you're looking at. So, for example, um, if you want to simulate a smart local energy system and you're a distribution network operator, you might be really focusing on network constraints. Whereas a local authority might want to know what happens to consumer bills or the overall carbon consumption. Um, but the general principle remains the same um, regardless of the stakeholder. And that is that distribution um, energy resources are going to be deployed more on the distribution network um, as we decarbonize and try to hit net zero. Um, and then stakeholders can use Zoo simu simulations in order to understand how that impacts the electricity network, how it impacts consumer bills, or how it impacts um, CO2 consumption. And on the next slide, I'll talk through how we kind of answer these questions. Um, so just briefly on this one, um, we'll normally look at a question and create a smart local energy system scenario. Um, and this involves kind of taking disparate inputs from a range of different um, sources. So you can see here um, on the diagram on the right hand side, the distribution network topology, um, which were, was provided by SSEN for Huntley. Um, so we ingest that along with some demographic data, historical and forecast weather data. Um, DNO future energy scenarios, which allows us to understand in 2030, in 2040, in 2050, how many assets are going to be on the network. Um, and then finally, we take asset specifications. So these can be from the device data sheets to allow us to understand um, what kind of assets are going to be deployed on the network. Um, and you can see an example on the right hand side here, the image, just how we would um, configure the software platform to have a Tesla power wall, for example, on the network. And once we've taken that um, kind of high level approach of what the energy system is going to look like, we move to constraining the problem. Um, and this again, depends on what stakeholder is looking at the energy system. Um, but I'll talk you through some examples. So you might want to look at the counterfactual for the energy system of today. And you might say all assets are dumb, meaning um, EV chargers charge as soon as an EV plugs in, for example. And then you might want to look, well, what happens when we're in the energy system of 2030, 2040? and all assets are smart. 
So you've got EVs that are performing some kind of time of use optimization themselves. Um, and then you get to an interesting stage where you can apply Zoos optimization or neighborhood wide optimization. So you, across all the assets in the neighborhood, you aggregate them together and perform energy sharing in order to minimize CO2 or the total cost of operating the system. And then the complexity builds again when the DNO comes in and says, well, you're actually operating in a constrained management zone here. I need you to make sure that you optimize within a grid limit. And then Zoo simulation lets us also do a combination of the above. So um, we can have some dumb assets, some smart assets and optimization all operating at the same time. So throughout the project, we've run some simulations and I'm going to talk about our key modeling results. Um, so our studies have shown that by using neighborhood wide optimization, the batteries or the assets on the network can share energy across the neighborhood in order to reduce the reliance on grid import um, during times of high carbon intensity. So this means that neighborhood level optimization is improving on the kind of selfish site level consumption that you might see uh, a battery on the market do today. We've also found that in Huntley, the low voltage network constraints are um, the ones that we hit into first as we deploy their assets across the network. Um, secondary substations becoming overloaded, voltage issues at the ends of feeders, um, all present problems before the primary substation becomes an issue. Um, so Zoos simulations again provides a way to perform some peak smoothing on that so that you don't hit limits quite so quickly as the air penetration increases. And the final point I want to touch on is that consumer preferences are the key to understanding how much flexibility is there on um, in a domestic home. So batteries are more or less always there. The state of charge might constrain you from having some flexibility if you've charged up with solar that day. But EVs and heat pumps, as we're going to see many more of those being installed, the user set point for those is incredibly important. Wanting to have a full EV battery at 7 a.m. is very different to wanting to have a, to have a full EV battery at 12 noon. And right now we're using um, some project specific data sets um, from the energy systems catapult, but we have an ambition to have data driven models that ingest real live data and then define what future set points are going to be. And then one more um, modeling result I'll talk about is on the next slide. Um, and I just want to talk through these two diagrams here. So on the left-hand side, we have the grid carbon intensity of GB as a whole. And on the right, we have it for the north of Scotland. Um, and these were both taken off of the Zoos website um, on Monday of this week um, as forecasts. And on the left-hand side, you can quite clearly see the, the good green times to operate assets if you're minimizing CO2 um, and the worst times in yellow. Um, but as you shift to the left-hand side, you can see that it completely flatlines. Um, so the question becomes, as we start seeing more days like the right-hand side across all of GB, um, is that problem solved? And the answer is, well, no, not really. Um, decarbonizing the wider grid um, from the transmission network down is going to be a big part of the solution. But as we found in our studies, you're going to run into issues. The low voltage networks and the distribution networks are not going to be able to cope with the amount of assets being installed. And in order to avoid these infrastructure upgrades that are needed, um, we need to look towards smart local energy systems that are coordinating demand um, within the neighborhood. So I'll just move to the final slide to some conclusions on this. Um, in the short term, 
Zoos can optimize assets, and we've shown that through our studies um, to operate at times of low grid carbon intensity. Um, however, over the longer term, once the grid is decarbonizing, the quickest and cheapest way to hit net zero is only going to be realized if we can defer and avoid network infrastructure upgrades. And for this, we need smart local energy systems. Um, so to hit net zero quicker and cheaper, the systems need to be coordinated and optimized at the neighborhood um, level. And with that, I will hand back to Alex. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Ryan. And thanks to all our speakers today. Um, very, some very interesting insights. I mean, just picking up on that final theme, the, the consumer expectation is going to be um, key to whether or not the, the way in which we're going to be able to drive this um, energy transition. Because your, your householder perhaps doesn't expect a full tank every time he leaves his house nowadays um, because he or she knows they've got to fill up a, a petrol station once in a while. But if you can charge every night at home, are your expectations going to change so that that's what you expect and demand? Or are we going to be able to roll out EV charging in parallel with flexible like, controls so that people accept that you know, you're going to get enough charge to get you where you need to go tomorrow, but it might not mean exactly the same as a full tank every time. Tank being the <laughs> um, old terminology, so to speak. So um, I'm going to stop the share now uh, and um, kind of open open up to to questions to so um if if uh, either there there's a uh, questions that have been put in the chat or if people want to kind of raise their hand and um kind of ask the question directly um then you know we've got an opportunity for the last sort of 10 15 minutes to just uh you know, ask some questions of the expert panel we've got assembled So why don't I, um, yeah, ask Jim, here, here we go. Great, thanks Alex. Yeah, so although I've been involved in uh, the the Zoos the project, the PFC Huntley project, uh, I didn't put together this presentation. Um, I was wondering, Ryan, um, uh, why not just upgrade uh, all, all the networks below the primary sub so that we can take advantage of the national uh, of any uh, national low carbon generation? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim. So I think what that kind of looks towards is one of the future energy scenarios that um, the NGESO and the distribution network operators look to, they have this kind of consumer transformation and system transformation. And the system transformation future energy scenario is looking at, well, we just upgrade everything and no one has to care. Um, but it looks to me and to us that the future is going to have assets installed at the distribution network level and it's not just going to be about um upgrading the system so it's going to be a kind of more incremental approach and the other thing is that that system transformation future energy scenario is costing more to and it's taking longer to reach net zero um so to put some numbers on it like the secondary substations that need to be upgraded and SSEN's network area, um, what is it we've got? Around 20% of the low voltage networks will be over 80% loaded by 2028. Um, so there are upgrades that are gonna be required if we continue down the future energy scenarios. Um, yeah. I think Thanks. I could just jump in there as well and say that the, uh, 
the disruption that's caused by the upgrades to the low voltage network by the very nature of where they are um, in terms of being in towns and cities um, it would it would be just it would decimate so much of our towns and cities to have to lift the roads to do those infrastructure upgrades and um, even if we could just defer some of them um, and and hopefully put off others altogether um, it would be um, it, it would be a much better place to be in than where we would be if we had to, as Ryan says, be upgrading 20% by 2028. And actually, I seen a SSEN um, webinar just yesterday where they were suggesting that um, a, a significant proportion of their um, uh, southern networks would be um, in a worse position than that sooner. Excellent. Well, something that um, struck me um, as being mentioned by, I think, all the speakers today was the, this issue around um, visibility, um, system visibility for the DNO um, came up with, with, with Rosie, uh, with JP and with um, Ryan. And the question is, obviously, like, and then we've got the barrier that identified by David around open data. So there's some issues or some some work happening around open data, but the, does any of the panel have some ideas of practical measures that can be taken to increase visibility? Well, I think from, from my perspective, what's going to be kind of crucial is making data available in a machine readable format to organizations who want to deploy LCTs. And there is work going on at the moment to um, from an open energy perspective, looking at basically standardizing metadata definitions and looking to create a sort of decentralized open energy system. There's going to be a huge amount of effort required by the networks, um, by technology partners, by OEMs to move towards a common trajectory where data can be accessible, as I say, on an automated basis to support planning, um, because that's one of the major barriers is really understanding where there's going to be available capacity on a network. And Scottish Power Energy Networks have been leading the way in relation to a project called Charge, um, looking at electric vehicle point, uh, data basically capacity availability. And that's been really helpful in terms of just sort of showing how through the use of modeling and visualization tools, you can support local authorities in directing projects to places where there is available capacity on the network. I think I would also come in on that and say more on the kind of distribution network topology side. Um, again, saying that some DNOs are ahead of others, but um, there does feel like there is a push towards having a common information model so that um, that network data can be ingested in the same format from each DNO, um, but progress is still slow on it and it's um, for this project, we had to go through GIS mapping for the specific town and integrate all of those network models. Um, but you can get a lot more done um, if, as you say, it's in a machine readable format. Thanks, Chris. And then what I found kind of quite interesting today was just the sort of big contrast between the sort of the, the generic and the specific and I'm just sort of picking up on the themes that, that, that David covered around um, the, the barriers so that um, those with bigger houses are more able to benefit from the net, net zero transition. Um, is there a solution? Because if you can't put air source heat pumps into people's homes, then what's what, what what's the what's the way in which terraced housing can decarbonize? Any any thoughts on that, David? Uh, well, there's an argument for um, going back to what we know almost um, with with electrification of heat, but direct um, either through storage heaters or through just old direct electric heating systems, um, seeing some infrared heating and other technologies as well. Um, but there's also, um, you can electrify some uh, 
current uh, wet central heating systems um, by putting a direct electric element in. Obviously, the barrier to that is the cost um, and the, the fact that it takes more um, energy um, to get the same heat output. Uh, but perhaps in a future energy scenario, like Ryan was showing, where you've got um, a, a completely decarbonized electric system um, and potentially a low cost electricity as well, um, that might not be a barrier. Um, so uh, is the government looking in the right way towards heat pumps? Well, given what we've seen in terms of the, uh, the infrastructure upgrades required in the home to be able to put in a heat pump where one doesn't exist already or the, the, the wet system doesn't exist, um, I, I think that the, the, the barrier is going to be around that um, change mentality with the, the homeowners and um, putting up the, uh, the upheaval of having a, the installations. Um, so it may be that we, we have to look at a, a two-pronged approach, certainly for a new build property where you can put in large emitters, underfloor heating, that kind of thing. Great, but maybe not so much for uh, a, a row of terraced houses. I think I just, I mean, I'll just comment that, you know, there's also the role of district heating. Yeah. So for, you know, sort of like terrace properties and dense developments, then district heating definitely has a role to play in that. Okay, thanks. So I see there's, there's a question popped in, up there from Eric, uh, Eric Appleton from the Energy Systems Catapult asking what's next for Zoos. Well, um, Zoos, uh, the Cloud Zoos project was uh, um, uh, a, a 21 month as it turned out to be. It was meant to be 15 months, but given the issues with the pandemic, there was a six month extension. That just came to an end there in September, but um, the, the the collaborators, the Edinburgh-based um, SMEs who've been working on developing the, the simulations and operations technology around Zoos have um, founded Zoos LTD um, in June. And we've got a opportunity to um, pitch in front of a worldwide audience of investors just in a couple of weeks at a, an event at COP26. And so the, the immediate next steps are to secure inward investment for the company to give it financial basis for continuing the work that we're doing. And then commercially, we're um, now progressing with um, our simulations platform on a project with um, Scottish Power Energy Networks, looking at how the simulations tool can work uh, with modeling um, coordinated flexibility on the system. So it's exci exciting times for, for us and um, for, for the panel here. So um, any, any other questions? Not, not many questions coming from the audience, but um, I, I mean, there's, there's plenty of things that came up um, for, for me from listening through what the panel were speaking on. Um, there's the other theme that came out, I think, was, you know, capturing that value. We invited people to, to kind of attend a session on the basis of a, a 10 billion pound question, you know, is the system um, as smart energy and flexibility really worth 10 billion? Um, we've realized that at a system level, there's an absence of um, localized supply tariffs, localized network and um, price signals, uh, and probably the, the uh, there, there's also sort of physical barriers. Um, like the, the, the prevent the ability for a flexibility in market to emerge. Um, we clearly need some system-wide changes. We need some um, kind of changes to mindset, um, both from business and consumer um, and uh, how, how, how they pan through is going to be, I think, critical to um, how, how effective we are in transitioning to net zero and how quickly we can do that. Um, any final closing remarks from the panel on that, that theme of capturing the value? Um, 
for the consumer and for the innovator. JP. Put you on the spot. I think he's on mute, Alex. You might need to unmute JP if he's going to. Do you want to jump in there, David? Oh, thanks for that, Alex. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, I think there's a great opportunity. I mean, the, the electrification of heat and transport in particular, as you said in your introduction, is going to add significant load. Um, but it's also going to give us that opportunity to... Um, to provide flexible services um, in, in home uh, and demand side response at a household level and then at neighborhood level and community level is gonna grow and grow. Um, so I think, yeah, there absolutely is uh, an opportunity there. Um, but something that we say a lot in Zoos is that um, quite often people want to have the benefit without even realizing that they're they're doing something, and that's what Zoos can give. Um, and systems like Zoos, maybe even with the VPPs as well, being plugged into that, is that um, without that um, the behaviour change on the part of the consumer, um, they can reap the benefits um, just by having those assets in their homes. Um, what we need to do is make sure that everyone can have those assets in their homes, which comes back to that idea about the just transition. Great, thanks. Thanks for that. Just like with realize we're kind of coming to the end of time. There's a, another question coming in there from Molly. Um, discussing demand side flexibility can seem like it's much more complicated than doing supply side flexibility interconnections, et cetera. What do you think will be the key thing that will convince government to go for decentralized solutions? Will it be the desire to avoid those disruptive roadworks to install more distribution assets, networks, equipment, or will it be consumer demand? So for me, I think, I think we're gonna see more citizen-led action. I think that the current crisis is gonna drive people to be more engaged and more active. And in terms of kind of future elections, there's got to be a sort of a bow wave of change from central government. Um, Scottish government and the Welsh Assembly are leading in terms of actually delivering on, you know, low carbon systems for consumers and doing it in a way that supports the just transition. And, you know, England really needs to start catching up with, you know, the progress that's being made. Great. Thanks, Rosie. Um, okay, so I don't want to run too too much over. Um, I'd just like to uh, sort of summarize by saying, well, we've covered the challenges at the macro level, the systematic uh, systemic systemic issues with the markets and supply chains. We've covered it at the micro level down to the congestion on the CT boards. We've uh, covered it in the physical level with the um, dormer windows and, and noise impacts and we've even touched on the metaphysical with um, the question of why is it that the rich will benefit and the poor will lose out. So on that note, um, I would like to thank everyone for coming along to listen today and I'd like to thank our panel speakers um, for, for your efforts and um, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks all. Cheers, Dave. Bye. Thanks, everyone.